Something strange happened a few weeks ago. I had viewers complaining that I didn't show enough audio examples on my Waves BB Tubes video, even though I showed practically inaudible nulls using pink noise at minus 12 dBFS. And this made me come to the realisation that many out there don't see noise as audio and also don't understand why an inaudible pink noise null normally bypasses the need for the most musical A-B tests. So I decided to make the most geekiest audio related video I probably ever will do on this channel. Now to explain the why in full, I need to go into a lot of basic audio science and before I do I want to make clear that whilst I have a degree in audio, I don't have any qualifications in regards to physics and audio science. This is all stuff that I've learned over the years via books, lectures, videos, so there may be some technical wording slip ups and I may miss some technical details and I can't say for certain that everything in this video is academically correct, but I've tried my best to use things that are well known and accepted as fact by most in audio and I've tried to prove as much as I can with the tools that I have at my disposal. Right, so with that out of the way, let's get into this. A simple statement to begin, but one that isn't well known from what I can see. All audio is sound. Simple, right? However, there are many out there that state that noise in what many classes real audio can't be tested the same way because we don't perceive noise the same way as music. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, but scientifically, noise and music are actually the same thing regardless of how they are perceived. They are both sound. The reason we know this to be true is because we can measure both on an SPL meter, which will give us a measurement in decibels. Doesn't matter if it's hiss from a radiator or a 1000 piece orchestra, it will measure a sound pressure level in decibels because it's all sound at the end of the day. Now this is important to understand because many online tend to dissociate noise from what they call real audio, which is normally sounds that are perceived as musical with varying dynamics. However, regardless of whether a sound is musical or not, sound is sound, and regardless of how a sound is perceived, it will still follow the same physics of a null test, which will produce the sum of all differences between two audio signals. This sum of differences is what we call a delta signal, which caters for frequency response, phase, harmonics, transient response, pitch, delay, modulation, volume, you name it, everything. No matter how complex the signal is, if any audio file is played alongside its direct opposite, which in audio is as simple as reversing the polarity of one signal 180 degrees, both will completely cancel the other out and you will be left with a completely silent delta signal. We all agree that this test shows us all differences between two files and the audibility of those differences can be measured via putting the delta signal through a spectrum analyzer which can show us the level of the delta over the frequency spectrum. Pretty simple science. Now, complexity is a subjective term, but I'll explain what I mean personally by complexity in the context of an audio signal. When I use the term complex, I refer to a signal's range of frequency response and sound intensity, which in scientific terms, means the amount of energy flowing per unit time through a unit area which is perpendicular to the direction in which the sound waves are travelling. To make more sense of that, think about how our ears pick up the sound of a car door slam. The slam creates vibrations, which in turn creates waves in the air. These waves enter our eardrums, causing them to vibrate, and it's our tiny little hair cells within our eardrums that are able to pick up different frequencies and pitches from the pattern of the vibrations caused by the waves. So in a very generalised take, the more complex the signal, the more frequencies it will produce at an equal intensity. So when considering a musical example to distinguish audible differences between two processes, you have to cater for the variables of music, because music is not made to be completely full range with all frequencies at an equal intensity. And this is where white noise comes into the equation. You see, when we generate white noise in the DAW, we generate a signal where all frequencies in the sample rate are constantly reproduced at an equal intensity or energy, whatever way you want to see it. Seems like the perfect sim source to use when summarising the maximum levels of difference. Right? In theory, yes, but in practice, we have one variable to cater for. 
Because at the end of the day, our preference isn't for sims that are full range with equal intensity, it's for dynamic acoustic sims that follow a melodic and harmonic structure. Musicians tend to view music more in the Western approach these days, which compacts music into 12 notes with numerous octaves. But what they tend to forget is that every note and its relative octave has a corresponding frequency. So when we play a chord on the piano, we aren't technically playing music, we are playing a collection of frequencies which results in a sound that the human brain finds pleasing because the frequencies are in harmony with each other, which in scientific terms means that there is a mathematical relationship with each frequency. For example, the interval between the note A, which is 440 Hz, and an E, which is 660 Hz, has a ratio of 2 to 3, and is a perfect fifth. Deviations from this math will be perceived as displeasing to the human brain, like when we hear an out-of-tune guitar and we wince. It's the human brain picking up that the frequencies are out of harmony with each other. This is also why we perceive harmonic distortion as pleasing and aliasing as strange, because it's inharmonic and deviates from the harmonic structure the brain wants to hear, or expects to hear. But what has all this got to do with noise? Well, this makes more sense when you add the understanding of the relationship between frequency and musical notes to the physical sound intensity of musical and natural sounds. Now, to make more sense, I read a piece online from Yamaha that talks about how most musical and natural sounds decrease in intensity at higher frequencies. And if you put any musical source in an audio analyzer, you will see that they all produce a lot of energy in the lower frequencies, and then it tails off in the higher frequencies. Now, some of you may be confused by this, because for most of you, you won't see your audio looking like a slope. You will see it more balanced like this. And the reason for this is because of the human perception of sound, which is altered by the way our inner ear hair cells of the cochlea are driven by certain frequencies. From what I could research, studies have shown that frequencies lower than 250 Hz largely bypass the inner ear even at intense levels, and this is why we are more sensitive to higher frequencies than lower frequencies. But all you need to know is that our ears have their own slope, which alters the intensity of how we perceive acoustic sounds, and most analyzers cater for this with a 4.5 dB slope, which many agree gives a close representation of what our ears actually hear. However, for this video to make sense, let's continue with the 4.5 dB slope off in span. So, we know that musical sounds have a slope due to the intensity decreasing with higher frequencies. We know that musical sounds are not full range all of the time, and their level varies. We know that white noise is full range, but every frequency has an equal intensity, which is not how we listen to music, which is what we are working with every day as engineers. So in an ideal world, we need a combination of the two, and this is where pink noise comes into the equation. Pink noise is white noise, but tilted in a way that results in a more musical outcome, as instead of every frequency being equal energy, every octave is equal energy. This results in a slope that essentially gives us what is classed by many as perfect sound, as it is basically the most full band, consistent signal one can use that follows the same intensity as acoustic sound that we class as music, but does so at the maximum possible ceiling for each frequency. And this is why I was taught to null pink noise when looking to confirm the realistic maximum audible differences between two processes. Because not only do I have all frequencies within the audible spectrum, I have all the audible frequencies at a consistent level, sloped in a way where the intensity of each frequency is correlated to how our ears perceive musical sounds. Now many will try and combat this by gibbering on about transient response. Please remember that a transient is just a short momentary high level peak. As long as your acoustic source does not exceed the max frequency peak, of the pink noise, it will not exceed the level of the pink noise null. And to prove this point, I have set up a very simple null test with GSAT Plus, where the saturation provides a barely audible difference when going in at moderate levels. I'm going to prove to you that regardless of input level and how dynamic and full range the musical source is, it will not produce a louder difference in any frequency range as long as its max frequency peak does not exceed the level of the pink noise at that specific frequency. Let's start with an uncompressed kick drum, looped at its loudest section, peaking at minus 6 dB full scale. 
with its loudest frequency peak being 60 Hz at minus 16.4 dB full scale. And for anybody that's confused by that, please bear in mind that the signal we see in SPAN is using spectral measurements, while the output meters are a mathematical sum of all the frequencies combined. There are normally coded formulas in every dB input and output meter that will spit out an overall dBFS measurement. What those formulas are, and if they are the same in every dB meter, I couldn't say. That's a question for all the DSP guys to answer in the comments. But however, as you can see, I've matched this by using SPAN's average and max preset, which shows the fixed max peak level per frequency in dark green and the average level of each frequency in light green. So as you can see, this pink noise signal will feed the saturator 60 Hz at the same level of the kick, as well as every other frequency in equal energy per octave. And if we measure the null with the 4.5 dB slope to represent how humans actually perceive the differences, the pink noise null produces a very audible difference in peaks and on average compared to the kick which shows audible peak differences but barely audible differences on average. This is because the pink noise is hitting the saturation at a constant high level where the kick's transients are so fast and sporadic they register on the meters in the analyzer, but don't contribute enough to the overall differences to make any real impact or difference on average. And for anybody saying, just peak level both so the pink noise isn't hitting the saturation so hard, blame it hell. Unfortunately, with sources that produce a lot of low end energy, this will result in a misleading null, as the pink noise isn't hitting the saturator as hot as the kick does in certain lower frequencies which shows the kick is producing a louder null in areas and also confuses the average difference reading. This is because acoustic sims have way more intensity in the lower frequencies, and with the pink noise being full range below 20 Hz, the louder the lower frequencies need to be to match the musical source, the louder the peak level will become as the loudest part of pink noise is its lowest frequency, because it's equal energy per octave, which in pink noise will always be lower than the acoustic source. This is why I've decided to flatten the analyzer when showing the pink noise in musical sources and solo, so you can see for yourself that just because we hear music with a different tilt doesn't mean that our tools receive them the same way. That's why sidechain high pass filter detectors were created in compressors, so you could have a heavy source with a lot of bass and trigger the wideband compression with higher frequencies, because no matter what you do, the lower frequency ranges will always exceed the threshold first because they have the highest intensity in the signal. It's just the physics of an acoustic audio signal. And that's why with acoustic sources that produce less low end energy, peak matching both can work. I'll use a snare as a good example. As you can see, both pink noise and this short loud snare loop hit max peaks of minus 12 dB full scale, and at no point does any frequency of the snare exceed the same frequency of the pink noise. So as expected, when we null and compare, the snare null barely peaks past minus 72 dB full scale and on average doesn't exceed minus 84 dB full scale, where the pink noise null shows some audibility because it is a much more complex and consistent signal as well as exceeding the snare's maximum frequency peak. A snare drum simply cannot have the complexity of pink noise. Even if we look at the snare's max peaks in the null, as we can see by the meters, these peaks are transients which are so fast they show in the dB meters barely in extremely short quick bursts, where the pink noise being equal intensity per octave all the time shows this as a full consistent signal. And that's why I only use the average preset and span when monitoring delta signals because that's what gives you the most realistic and audible feedback in regards to concluding audibility. Now, just a little tip. You don't always have to use pink noise on acoustic sources that have a lot of bass energy. You can easily use a more heavily sloped variation of pink noise, which will create more intensity in lower frequencies and less intensity in high frequencies. Brown noise is an option, but I found that a minus 7.5 dB slope works pretty well for bass guitar, as bass guitars tend to reproduce very little in the higher frequencies. As you can see on this bass guitar, when I match the bass's highest frequency peak to the minus 7.5 dB slope, they actually both look very similar. And for anybody complaining that the bass example is too quiet, I also use Mix Monolith to set the bass level, so these examples are at a very realistic bass guitar level, which is very important when concluding if something is going to offer something audible enough for you within the context of an actual mix. 
I'll bring this down to minus 90 dB full scale so you can see this better. The minus 7.5 dB slope results in a louder and more complete delta signal, while the bass guitar shows differences that barely exceed minus 84 dB full scale. And just to confirm the importance of the default 4.5 dB slope and span, here is the bass delta with the slope flattened to 0 dB. As you can see, the bass delta now looks to be within our audible range, when in reality it's actually not. That's why when I show nulls on my channel, I never change span from its default slope setting because it's absolutely pointless countering for differences that will most likely bypass our inner ear. The 0 dB slope proves scientifically that there are differences, but it doesn't prove that they are audible to the human ear, and that is what is the most important factor when doing these tests, because at the end of the day, audibility is subjective. I'd personally say that audibility in regards to any real detail comes in at about minus 65, 60 dB RMS but that's obviously subjective. If you ask many honest engineers, they'll normally tell you around minus 60 dBFS, as that's normally the default limit of most DAW meters. And that's where a lot of logic comes into this, because to most, if the DAW meter doesn't have any signal coming through, then it's not audible. That's what many assume, anyway. But either way, you can understand why I class frequency buildups in a null under minus 80, 85 dB full scale, to be inaudible differences because, for me anyway, that is where the delta starts to bring in any real detail that can affect any audibility when added in with a much stronger signal. And this is a crucial factor that many online forget when deliberating on the audible impact of differences. What our delta shows is the sum of the difference between both files or processes. That delta makes up part of the original signal. That's why I used a null where only one file has processing on it so I could show you the full difference added by one process. Because what this allows me to do is measure the loudness of that difference in relation to the original signal. I'll show you what I mean. I've printed the kick and bass nulls, flipped the polarity of both so they're back in phase with the original, and combined each to their corresponding original file by sending just those two to the master bus. What this allows me to do is measure the loudness of the original source and then measure the loudness of the original and the printed null together so we can actually measure just how loud that difference is in relation to the entire signal. So let's do the bass first, which if we recall produced a null with partial audibles barely reaching minus 78 dB full scale, which I would personally class as inaudible in regards to difference. Now, I've sped this up to save time, and that there is the short-term and integrated LUFS of the original bass. Now, if we add in the bass null track and measure the loudness, you can see that the difference equates to only 0.1 dB. 0.1 dB. Now, to put that into context, Sam Don Sound had an article talking about how it is believed that a skilled listener is supposed to be able to hear a change of 1 dB or more while less skilled listeners need more like 2 to 3 dB before they are sure there is an audible difference. Either way, in the case of the bass, 0.1 dB is minuscule. To put it into mathematical terms, if we class 29.3 dB as 100% of the signal, 0.1 dB equates to 0.3% of the signal. Remember, 0.1 dB is a tenth of a dB. And if there's one thing I know, I don't know any professional that would admit to be able to hear a 0.1 dB difference in anything. Especially within the context of a full mix. But of course, there will be some that straight tell the internet they can. <laughs> All I've got to say to that lot is, I would love to see you picking that one out in a triple blind test. Because it won't happen. And to be honest, it doesn't surprise me because of the way that the human brain works. Now, to put this into context, when I first started doing shootouts before YouTube, I used to level match by ear quite a lot, and I found because my brain expected there to be audible differences, my manual gain change was affected due to a subconscious bias. In other words, I believed that there should be a difference, so I subconsciously made sure that there was a difference in my level matching. Trust me, I've experienced it firsthand and watched many content creators do the exact same in their plugin reviews. I personally level all of my videos to short-term LUFS because I don't want any possible variable, and many would argue that I'm OTT for doing that, but let me use the kick example to show you exactly why it's important to properly level match everything you do. 
OK, so same as before, let's measure the level of the kick drum, which peaked at minus 6 dBFS. OK, now let's add in the delta signal that had max frequency peaks of minus 52 dB full scale, but average max frequency peaks of minus 78 dBFS. And as I expected, the null produces a louder signal than the bass null, but only by half a dB. That's right, the difference in the kick only equates to 0.6 dB, which, by what we talked about earlier, is still nearly half a dB too quiet to be perceived by many or all skilled listeners. And this is why level matching is so important, because if we take this situation very literal, then in theory, there would only need to be a 0.4 dB level variance in favour of the chain signal for it now to give the impression of audible differences compared to the unprocessed signal. And the more variance in level there is, then the difference will appear more audible, when in reality, for example, a 3 dB difference in this kick test would be a combination of a 0.6 dB actual difference and 2.4 dB level variance. In this specific scenario of 3 dB, the actual difference caused by the saturation only equates for 20% of the full difference. 80% of the difference is taken up by level, which doesn't have any correlation whatsoever to the difference in both files or processes. And for anybody complaining that there isn't a full extreme musical example yet, <laughs> here is a royalty-free heavy limited EDM trap that encompasses all frequencies and is extremely transient heavy. As you can see, I've had to really increase the level of this pink noise to match the max frequency peak of the EDM track, which sits at around minus 15.6 dBFS around 48 to 50 Hz. True peak of minus 0.9 dB, yes we can confirm it's a limited track, and if you notice the max frequency peak is so loud, my pink noise actually has a true peak of plus 4.2 dB. However, regardless how loud, how full range, how limited, how processed the EDM track is, it still can't produce a louder delta signal than the pink noise. As you can see, the highs peak at minus 40.9 dB full scale at 13.6 kHz, where the pink noise null peaks around minus 37 dB full scale. Same story in the lows, minus 53.1 dB full scale max peak at 100 Hz, minus 52.9 dB full scale in the pink noise null. So as you can see, pink noise encompasses all possible differences there can be. And in this scenario, there is a lot of audible differences, which makes absolute sense considering that I have went into the saturation plugin way harder than most would, which in turn creates a lot of saturation in the signal, which would tell me I definitely need to do a level matched A-B test. And that's where I'll end this video. But <laughs> before I go, I will be kind and leave you with one audio example. I'll leave you with the kick example, but I'll make it a little bit tricky. One will be the original versus GSAT Plus, and the other will be two originals, but with one down 0.6 dB to see if you all could one, tell me which is which in both, and two, tell me which test is which. Personally, I'm just interested to see how audible a 0.6 dB difference actually is, and what I would like you to do is pick your answers via the poll I have put on the community section of my channel. Me, being completely transparent and honest, even with critical listening, it is a struggle, and I would be very interested to see how you all fare. So as always, if you appreciate the time and effort I put into this video, consider donating a super thanks, which you'll find on the same tab as the like button, which I'd really appreciate you hitting as well. My name is Paul Third. Thank you so much for sticking around for the whole video. I'll see you again next week.